All right, guys, it is now uh, 1023, today 23rd, 1023, 2020. Uh, we are in doing a RT210C pulmonary AMP, and we're about to do a um, review, a quick review all the way through really quickly, and then we're going to do those uh, review questions and practice uh, oral questions like we talked about yesterday. Um, <clears throat> so I just want you to relax. Don't worry about what's going on around you. Just focus on this, okay? Um, yesterday, well, not yesterday's, but the 21st lecture does not work, okay? It does not come through. I think it's because I played a video uh, from YouTube in it and it, it stopped it, okay? So <clears throat> I'm going to do a review today, but in the event in the future, Recorded lectures are not guaranteed, okay? Um, it's just like if you were on campus and you were absent one day. The teacher's not going to go back and tell you all everything you missed yesterday, okay? You get the notes from somebody who was there, and you do the reading, the PowerPoints, uh, to catch up on what you missed, all right? That's why it's important to be live if you can be live, or be here if you can be here. But focusing or planning on just watching lectures, that's not going to get you through respiratory. Okay, it's just not. All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna start with the, share my screen with the PowerPoint. I'm just gonna use the PowerPoint as I go for the review. All right, slideshow. All right, pulmonary AMP. All right, so we talked about the upper airway. <clears throat> we said the upper airway's job is to warm, humidify, and filter gas. It contains the concave turbinates that allows for maximum surface contact. It contains the nose, the mouth, and the pharynx, and the pharynx it's made up of three parts, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. Uh, the upper airway structures are uh, in more in depth are here. It was one of your homework assignments. The lower airway, after we <clears throat> leave the upper airway, we start going into the lower airway, which is, is the cadaver, a real human cadaver here that has donated his body to science. You notice here he has the thyroid cartilage, right then we have the trachea okay and then one of these rings in the trachea would be the chorine i mean a cricoid right it's made of different types of cartilage the unpaired cartilage would be the epiglottis which is inside you can't see it the thyroid cartilage which is this that butterfly shaped cartilage okay and then you have the cricoid Cricoid cartilage is the only complete ring of the trachea. The rest of them are C-shaped rings. A bunch of C-shaped rings, and only one of them is a full circle, and that is the cricoid. <clears throat> this is another picture here. This is that uh, butterfly structure here is the thyroid cartilage, also known as the Adam's apple, okay? Adam's apple or Eve's apple, because both of y'all, we both have a thyroid cartilage, okay? Men's is more, a little more pronounced than women's, but we both have a th thyroid cartilage. <clears throat> this is the trachea, right? And this is the cricoid. Cricoid goes all the way around. The rest of them are just little C-shapes from here to here, like staples, from here to here, from here to here. The rest of them, I like that. This one goes all the way around. That's significant. <clears throat> Snow picture of the tracheobronchial tree by computer generated images, starting at the, what is this? The trachea, which is generation zero, breaks off into the right and left main stem bronchus, and then the bronch, bronchi, which, uh, which are the <clears throat> segmental bronchi, right? Then we go into the bronchioles, right? And terminal bronchioles, 
and then respiratory bronchioles will be way at the bottom, okay? Way at the bottom. And the respiratory bronchioles house uh, the what? What are the little sacs called? Alveoli. That's where the rest. That's where the alveoli are connected to the respiratory bronchioles. And what they do is uh, they're responsible for gas exchange. When we get into pulmonary mechanics, we're going to learn a whole lot more about that alveoli and the gas that is exchanging and the formulas <clears throat> that let us know what our minute ventilation. How much of this gas is going in and out in a minute? How much of this gas is going out in just the alveoli? Because all of this, all of this is has air in it, right? But the conducting zones is just air that's being pushed all the way down to the respiratory bronchioles. Okay? And so the respiratory bronchioles is the only place where the magic is happening. This little thin this little place in right here will be the parenchyma of the lung, right? You get off the bus at the terminal and walk into the land of the parenchyma. Okay, the parenchyma, and that's uh, where the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli are housed. Okay, so we're going to know how much volume goes through the whole thing, which is the minute ventilation, and how much just is going in the alveoli. That will be alveolar minute ventilation. You also want to know how much pressure of oxygen is in that alveoli. Okay, and that's going to be what you want to. You gotta find out how much pressure is inside of that alveoli. That's how deep you're getting ready to go. Okay? You're getting ready to go deeper. So for instance, let me stop the share for just so those that are watching. For instance. We have the parenchyma, which has the alveoli, right? And 21% of the air outside is oxygen. Okay? Outside. But inside, <clears throat> when we breathe it in, okay? Um, there's going to be a, a gas exchange that takes place. And by the time the gas exchange takes place, the pressure of oxygen inside of here should be about 100 millimeters of mercury. Okay? Now, this is a percentage, and this is a pressure, right? Millimeters of mercury is a pressure. Now, in order to find out what the pressure is outside, I'm just going to tell you, Oxygen exerts a pressure of 159 millimeters of mercury outside. But when it comes into the alveoli, we have to start subtracting. Because not only uh, we have that going in, but we have nitrogen going in, right? We have argon going in. And the only thing we want to know about is the O2. All I want to know inside that alveoli is the pressure of oxygen, because that pressure of oxygen is going to transfer into the capillary, right? Because the capillary picks up the oxygen, takes it back to the body, right? So when I stick your body, the pressure of oxygen inside there should be 80 to 100. It should be just like this, okay? If it's not like this, there's a problem. There's a disease process that's keeping the oxygen from getting into the bloodstream, okay? That's uh, different types of you're going to learn different type of diseases will keep the blood, I mean, oxygen from diffusing into the blood. Could be a type 1 cell problem because the type 1 cells are responsible for what? Type 1 alveolar cells are responsible for what? Gas diffusion. Yeah, exchange. Gas diffusion. So if the type 1 cell is jacked up, then the gas can't go back and forth, right? So that could be a problem. All right, so what I say that to say is alveolar. Remember, little a is what? What does little a stand for? What does little a stand for? What does big a stand for?
Big A is alveolar and arterial. I'll tell you, you got to go back and look at these, all your sections. Because you're going to start getting hit with these letters, symbols, and abbreviations. And if you still don't know what they are or have to go back and find those, you're going to be behind. Okay? Little A is arterial. And big A is alveolar. And P is what? Pressure. All right. Piece of pressure or partial pressure. So I want to know, when I speak your blood, I'm looking for the partial pressure of arterial oxygen. P little a O2. When I speak your artery. I'm looking for the partial pressure of arterial oxygen. That's letting me know how much of that oxygen pressure left the alveoli and actually went into the, uh, the capillary doing as exchange, the magic in the parenchyma. Okay? This number should be very close to this number, partial pressure of alveolar. O2. P big A O2. Can you see it? Huh? Can you see? Okay. All right, so this is the partial pressure of arterial O2, and this is the pressure or partial pressure of alveolar O2. So the reason why I say that is because we said that oxygen exerts a pressure right now. In this room, it's called room air. Oxygen at room air is 21%. The percentage of oxygen in room air is 21%. Coming from a tank, it's 100%. Okay. So, <clears throat> that percentage, we have to take, and you're going to learn this a little later, so don't worry about it. You take, you have to do this. The barometric pressure, everybody ever heard of barometric pressure before? When they say the barometric pressure, well, you might not know what it is, but that you've heard it, okay? Well, the barometric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. Barometric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay? And so to find out how much of that is oxygen, you have to just multiply by the percentage. Okay? The whole thing, which is oxygen, CO2, argon, uh, nitrogen, right? And trace gases, all of those have a percentage. So if oxygen is 21% and nitrogen is 78%, of what you're breathing right now, and argon is, I think it's 0.7%. We'll learn a little bit later, make sure. I think argon is that. Don't worry about argon. If these are different percentages, then we multiply the percentage by the barometric pressure, and we get how much pressure that particular gas is exerting, okay? Because all the gases in the air have their own pressure, okay? Just like gumbo. If you make some gumbo, you have several ingredients, right? But each, and if I pull, and it has a taste, right? One taste. But if I pull each individual ingredient out, it's going to have its own what? Taste. The corn, the, what, what's that? The sausage, the rice, the okra, whatever is in it, going to have its own taste if I take it out. But if I put it together, it has one universal taste. So all of these pressures have their own, I mean, all these percentages have their own pressure. But when I take them out, they, they exert their uh, own pressure. But when I put them together, they're 760, okay? And so to find out how much oxygen is in the, how much pressure oxygen is exerting outside, we have to do 760 times 0.21. Somebody do that for me. 760 times 0.21. Because whenever you multiply a fraction, I mean a, a percentage, look, 
21%. If I multiply that, it is now 0.21. You have to say 0.21 times whatever. You can't put the percentage. Okay? It's one of those mathematical things you should know. 159, see? So 159. So oxygen exerts 159 millimeters of mercury, of pressure. Okay? And so we have to factor all of this in when we want to know how much oxygen actually made it to the alveoli. Okay? How much pressure of oxygen actually made it to the alveoli? And that will be this famous equation that you want to be doing here next. Next week. It's called the alveolar air equation. Looks bigger than it is. P big A O2 equal F I O2 times P bar minus the pressure of water minus the P little a CO2, which is the partial pressure of arterial CO2, divided by the respiratory quotient. That is the form. That's called the alveolar air equation. Alveolar air equation. How much pressure of oxygen is actually in that alveoli? But when we breathe in, we're breathing in 159 millimeters of mercury of it, right? But it has to be, it has water in it because the, it's, the humidity is water vapor. You will learn that too. We have to subtract the water away from it. We have to just subtract the CO2 away from it, right? And we have to take in account the P bar, which is the barometric pressure. The barometric pressure is known as P bar, pressure of, of the barometric, right? Barometric pressure. There's a pressure of water in the air that you're breathing in. That's it's water vapor in this air because it's humidity, okay? It's not completely dry. And so that's a number. Then you have to find out, well, what's the FiO2? Are they breathing room air, which is 21%, or are, am I giving them oxygen, okay? Because if I'm giving you some oxygen, then that pressure should be higher. Because now I'm giving you supplemental from the machine or from the tank, right? Then I have to take away the CO2 and the respiratory quotient. And that will give me a normal value of P big A O2 of about 100 millimeters of mercury. So we're going to get into that next. I just want to give you a little taste of it. Because you need to know where this stuff is happening, right? In the parenchyma. The parenchyma of the lungs is where all of this is happening. Now, what I just showed you is not on this test. It's coming up next. But I showed you that to show you that uh, it's going to be imperative that you don't sleep on what you've learned. Okay, because now I'm adding those abbreviations. You got to know them in order to know what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, today we're talking about the pulmonary, the anatomy, the alveoli, the cells of the alveoli, uh, <clears throat> what they're responsible for. Because when I do this and that my pressure inside my arterial oxygen is not close to my alveolar oxygen, then what's wrong? Why ain't it? Right? You're going to have to figure that out. Oh, because he has this. Or, oh, because she has that. Okay, and if I tell you uh, this person has this or that, you can know what to expect. Okay, and so that's what therapy is, not just breathing treatments. So it's only going to get deeper. So you have to go back, master that stuff so that you can understand what's happening. Because a lot of times uh, <clears throat> when that blood leaves that alveoli and that pressure of oxygen is not right, then that means it didn't pick up oxygen, right? The blood never picked up the oxygen and returned to the heart without it. And remember, we said that's a right to left shunt. Blood goes from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. 
uh, without picking up oxygen is called a shunt. All right, to left shunt. It didn't pick it up. The blood was there, but the alveoli was closed. Right? If you go to the store with money in your pocket, but the store is closed, you go back home with money in your what? Pocket. That's a shunt. Think of shunt and shut. Shunt, shut. The store was shut, or alveoli was shut. You had the money, but if the store ain't open, you can't spend it. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Well, let's keep going. Huh? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it, it paused for me. You see my thing moving around now? Okay. So that's when I, I showed you all that to show you, that's when we start getting further than the alveoli, knowing what's going on, how much pressure are we dealing with, what percentages are we talking about, okay? And the rest of the stuff, the rest of the gas that's in the conducting zone ain't doing nothing. It's just wasted. It's wasted ventilation. Okay, I'm almost talking about that. It's also called dead space. All of the space in the conducting zones is dead space, right? There's the gas inside those conducting zones is not participating in what? Gas exchange here. Pay attention to me now. The gas is inside of the conducting zones is not to hey, not participating in gas exchange, right? So that's considered dead space, right? Also, so another another quick example of dead space would be uh, if I have this tubing right here, this is for engines, and I got this and I'm hooked up to a machine, okay? And if I'm breathing through, a, through this machine and it's giving me air, right? Well, the gas, the gas that's inside my alveoli is taking place in gas exchange, right? But what about the gas that's inside of this tube? Is it taking place in gas exchange? No, not only the gas that's inside of that alveoli is taking place in gas exchange at that any given moment. So the moment that I stop or whatever, the gas that's inside of here is dead space. It's just wasted, just like the trachea, just like the left and right main stem bronchus, just like the bronchi, right? Bronchioles, terminal bronchioles. All of the gas from the terminal bronchioles back to the machine is dead space that's not participating in gas exchange. Only when it gets off the bus into the land of the parenchyma. When it gets into the land of the parenchyma, then that's when we see the respiratory bronchioles, right? Which is the next generation, the respiratory bronchioles, which house the brakes or the sacs or the alveoli, okay? That's where gas is exchanging. And that's why we have minute ventilation. And then you're gonna find out what alveolar minute ventilation is. We subtract the dead space to find out exactly just what's being transpired in the alveoli. That's pulmonary mechanics coming up next. Okay. All right. This one, the picture here was just uh, some of the layers of the trachea bronchial tree, uh, the tissue layers, right? The epithelium goes all the way down, right? You have the conducting zone and the respiratory zone. Respiratory zone is the parenchyma. Okay, this is where the respiratory bronchioles start. This will be the respiratory bronchioles right here, these right here, and then these are the alveoli. Okay, up here will be terminal bronchioles, right? And bronchioles, then bronchi, right? Uh, and then left and main, left, left and right main stem bronchus, and then trachea, right? And where the trachea bifurcates left and right, this spot right here is called the parina. So I'm not going. I'm not going. You're not going to be responsible which level has the ciliated cells and which level has the hyaline part. I'm not asking all. That, okay, you don't have to know all that. Just know what I, what we've been teaching. Just for your information. Then of course we got into this alveolus itself, the alveolus. And more than one alveolus is alveoli, right? So this is the alveoli. All of these is the same. Three different types of pictures. You see the deoxygenated blood comes from uh, uh, back from the body, right? And it dumps into the right atria via the uh, superior and inferior what? In my heart. Okay. And then it uh, leaves the right atrium, goes down into the right ventricle via the 
tricuspid valve, and then from the tricuspid valve, I mean, from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery via the pulmonary valve, and then into the, no, no, after the pulmonary valve, I mean, pulmonary artery goes into the, the lungs. Okay, now here it is right here. This is when it entered the lungs right here, blood in. Deoxygenated pulmonary circulation. No oxygen, right? It just left the pulmonary artery and now it is into the capillary on its way to pick up oxygen in the alveoli, okay? So it goes by the alveoli. It drops off the CO2 and picks up the what? Oxygen, that's gas exchange. When it leaves the alveoli, now it's red, right? It's oxygenated. Now it's headed back, so this is the lungs, headed back to the heart via the pulmonary veins, okay? And they dump into the left atria. We're on the systemic side right now. Left atria down through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle, then through the aortic valve into the, and then to the, it's going to take it to the body, let you use it. It's going to get used up and then it's going to head back. Every beat, boom, boom. It came, went, boom, 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 boom. That fast. And every breath you take, it's picking up, dropping off, picking up, dropping off. It's like a factory just going on since you've been alive. So be wary of what you put in your body. This picture here is the same exact thing. It's just a different picture. I just put several pictures on it, okay? But deoxygenated blood coming from the heart on the pulmonary side into the to the uh, alveoli co2 which is the used up uh carbon dioxide is it's uh carbon dioxide is the byproduct of metabolism when you move and you work out your muscles and your muscles are using and burning to live and make you be able to do what you do that's metabolism and the waste product of metabolism is carbon dioxide and the body has to get rid of that okay so it dumps it all into the alveoli so you can blow it out, okay? You take a deep breath in, suck in oxygen, does gas exchange, it dumps off the CO2, picks up the oxygen, and then you, when you blow out, that's carbon dioxide. What you just used, what your body just used, just came out, okay? Now, this is a cross-section of, if I was to look down the top of an alveoli and a capillary beside it, right? So this picture right here is the capillary, which is this, okay? And it, what, what it is, it's just a cross section. Like I'm looking down into this. Like if this is the capillary, if this is a capillary, this picture over here is looking down the capillary like that, okay? And then beside it is the alveoli, down on cut, like a cross section, cut it, and you're just looking down into the alveoli. The type one cells are responsible for gas exchange or gas diffusion, right? If that type one cell is not working right, then the oxygen and the CO2 can't get through, right? If the oxygen and the CO2 cannot get through, that's gonna be a problem. It's gonna show up on my oxygen sac, it's gonna show up in my ABG. Cause I'm like, I'm sticking your blood, but the oxygen is low. Why is the oxygen low? Oh, because it never picked it up in the lungs. Why didn't it pick it up in the lungs? Oh, maybe because it's a type one cell issue, malfunction or disease. And so the blood was there, it got to the alveoli, but it just got blocked. It just won't, some of it came through, but not much. It should be, right? But if there's a dysfunction here, if there's a dysfunction here, the oxygen is trying to get through, make a little bit get through, but that's it. A little bit get through, right? And so it's, it shows by my oxygen concentration. And if my oxygen is low, I'm gonna have a low saturation on the board. I'm going to have a low partial pressure of arterial oxygen in my ABG. And I'm also going to look how? How am I going to look if my oxygen is low? Blue. Blue. Sio sciotic, right? Because cyanosis is a lack of oxygen. It's a blue color. Lips turning blue. Hands turning blue. Feet turning blue. Okay? I need to get them some oxygen. Some reason the blood is not picking up oxygen in the lungs. Now, what carries oxygen in the, in the blood? Hemoglobin. So that also could be a problem. So there's several problems that I can look for. So then I get a blood count and see if his hemoglobin is too low. Because if his hemoglobin is 5 and it should be 12 to 15, that's the problem. 
we need to give him infused blood, okay? Because the lungs might be working perfectly, alveoli wide open, blood flow running, but the hemoglobin is low because hemoglobin is what carries that oxygen to dump it out, and, you know what I'm saying? And so if the hemoglobin is low, then the oxygen is going to be low, all right? So then we have to infuse them a, tr a blood transfusion, give them a pack of red blood cells, okay? Because the red blood cells have hemoglobin, okay? Uh, so that could be a problem. Uh, <clears throat> it could be a problem if there's a circulation issue. Your heart is not pumping well. And so if the heart is not pumping well, there's no perfusion. The alveoli are wide open, but the perfusion is just sprinkled around it, right? Sprinkle, sprinkle, right? And so that will be dead space. That's a dead space problem because the air is there, but it's not transpiring in gas exchange because the blood is not there, okay? You gotta have both. You gotta have perfusion and ventilation. You gotta have the perfusion and ventilation. So if this is my ventilation here, my alveoli, I also have to have the blood flow. I have to have perfusion. That capillary gotta be perfusion, right? If it's not perfusing, then there's no exchange, okay? So if I have an alveoli like this, and then the blood is like this, that's not a lot of perfusion, right? That's ventilation, but no what? It's perfusion, that's called dead space. That's called dead space. Unit. Each alveoli is a unit. This one right here will be a normal unit. Okay? That will be a normal unit. Because you got ventilation and you have what? Perfusion. Well, if you have a desk, I mean a, a shunt unit, it will be like this. We got perfusion, but we don't have what? Ventilation. Alveolus closed. So that would be a shunt unit. And then finally, what if I have this? I have no perfusion and no what? Ventilation. That is a Let me make sure everybody sees that. So when you go back on, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it on your screen, the board? Okay. So when you have a dead space unit, each alveoli is a unit. A dead space unit would be ventilation, but no perfusion. Okay. A normal unit is ventilation and perfusion. A shunt unit would be no ventilation, but good perfusion. See, blood went to the blood left the heart, went to the lungs, but nobody was there, so it came back to the heart, null and void. That's a right to left shunt, right? Shut, shunt, shut. Okay, and then if you have both, uh, no perfusion and no ventilation, then that is a solid unit. Ain't nothing going on. Okay, no perfusion and the alveoli closed. That's a very critical patient. Now, how many alveoli do we have? 300, 300, 300, 300, 300, 300. Right, so we got 300, 600 million units, right? That's a lot of units. Now, that don't mean that if one of them is not working, then you ain't breathing. You got 300 to 600 million of them. It could be a, list, a couple of sections that are not working. We just pop you open a little bit, right? Just like I had this, if I had this uh, drink this, I have an alveoli that's closed up, right? Then I can hyperinflate that person, right? We give them some positive pressure, put them on a device called a hyperinflation and pop it back open. That's all we're doing, right? When it's closed up like that, we try to hyperinflate the patient and pop those lungs open, right? Pop those alveoli back open so they can be normal again, okay? Unless they're completely diseased or something, which we'll learn a little later, okay? Those units, you don't, not on this test, but you do, if you write them down, take a note, excellent, because they'll show on the next one, okay? 
on the next lesson. I'm trying to give you some of that so you can relate it to what we're doing now so that it's not, you don't forget because you have to use everything to understand all the new stuff, okay? All right. So this alveoli has type one cells right here, which is responsible for gas diffusion. So it makes sense that this cell, type one, makes up most of the alveoli. I think it's like 95% of the alveoli cells are type one cells, okay? Because that's the main job of the alveoli is the gas exchange, all right? Then you have the type two cell, which is also known as the clara cell. And it's responsible for secreting what? Surfactant. Surfactant is a detergent-like phospholipid that helps break the surface tension down. All right? Surfactant is a, a detergent-like phospholipid that decreases the surface tension of the alveoli. That, therefore, a large alveoli can communicate with a smaller one without sucking it in. Right? We said we use the uh, example, if you are watching a raindrop come down your window, a little bitty raindrop, and it's headed to touch a really big raindrop, when it gets close to that big raindrop, it's going to do what? Suck it in, okay? That's the law of Laplace. Uh, so when we get to gas laws, you're gonna learn about Laplace. And he says that because of the surface tension, a larger sphere will suck in a smaller one, okay? but our creator made surfactant. So that does not happen. So now both the large alveoli and the small alveoli have the same surface tension. So they can live comfortably together with no problem. It's not gonna suck it in because of surfactant. Surfactant also helps stretch the lungs because if they're very stiff, they might be because they don't have enough surfactant. So it helps stretch out as well, okay? And so, we said these alveoli communicate through the what? Pores of con. Good, good. You got it. You would have saw it on the test and would have known. They communicate through the pores of con. And that communication is called collateral ventilation. Collateral, to so think about lateral, right? To side to side, collateral ventilation. They ventilate side to side with each other, okay? Now, the alveola also communicates with the respiratory bronchiole. And that is called the canals of Lambert, okay? So that's two different things. The alveola itself, so look at my page right here. On the, the alveoli itself can have, communicate with this respiratory bronchiole, right? These are the respiratory bronchioles here, right? And the, the alveoli can communicate with the respiratory bronchiole through the canals of Lambert. But the alveoli connect or communicate with each other through the pores of Kahn. And that communication is called collateral ventilation, right? So that way, Hey, I need a little oxygen. Let me, let me get some of that oxygen because I got some blood over here that's ready to pick it up, but I don't have enough at this point. Give me some of yours. And it'll shoot some in there, right? Or here, take some of this CO2 on your way out and give it to us. So they communicate with each other like that. They, they help each other out, okay? And because of surfactant, the big one doesn't suck the smaller one in it, right? Because of um, the surface tension problem. But surfactant kills that problem, okay? Kills that problem. And then finally, we have the type three cell are the macrophages. And those are the ones that just sit around and wait for just in case something does get in here, I'm gonna eat it, okay? So the nose is supposed to be filtering and protecting, right? We have a mucus blanket that's supposed to be trapping particles and the cilia supposed to be beating it up back toward the mouth, right? Uh, we know that the mucus blanket has two layers, the gel layer, which is closest to the air, right? and the sole layer, which is closer to the, seat, the tissue, right? So when the air coming in, so for instance, if this was the trachea, the gel layer, what I'm talking about, the mucus veins on the inside, not the outside, it's on the inside, because the air is going through here, right? So the, in, the inner part right here, closest to the air will be the, the gel layer. So all the little particles that you breathe in, 
they get trapped on the gel layer, okay? And the sole layer will be closest to the actual tissue, okay? And then there's little cilia that come up through the sole layer and they beat this way, one direction, up toward the mouth so you can cough it out, right? But for instance, I mean, for some reason, a piece of material makes it past all of that and gets into the alveoli, then the type three cells say, thank you, and eat it, okay? I don't think so, not that I know of. It could be a, it could be a um, disease out there that there's something wrong with the type three cells, but I, I don't know it yet. You can research that though, okay? All right, <clears throat> moving right along. This is just another picture here, more showing you that surfactant layer. Because look, alveolar type two cell makes surfactant, right? And it's pouring out surfactant. So you have a surfactant layer in there. And then inside, it should just be nothing but air, right? It should be nothing but air in here. You have your surfactant layer, right? You have your type one cells, and you have this big macrophage right here that will eat up foreign material. Then we said the lungs and the thorax. We said the lungs and the thorax main purpose was for external respiration. External respiration, that's the job of the lung. What is the job or the function of the lungs? You better pick external respiration. I even underlined it right here, okay? External respiration, that is the gas exchange between outside and the alveoli. Gas exchange between the outside and the lungs. The lungs are the alveoli, okay? If they say outside and alveoli, they talk about the outside and the lungs, okay? Because the lungs, 300 to 600 million alveoli in your lungs, okay? Internal respiration is gas exchange between the capillary and the tissue, okay? Because there are no lungs in your feet. There are no lungs in your legs, right? But there's still gas exchange happening there because the muscles are using the oxygen and the nutrients and they're producing CO2, okay? And so that way, the capillaries that are laying on top of the muscles pick up that CO2 and give off the oxygen. That's gas exchange between the tissues and the capillary, but that's internal. So that's called internal respiration. But the lungs are responsible for external respiration. Then we said the lungs have lobes. The right lung has how many lobes? Three. The left lung has how many lobes? Two. And it also has a little section called the... Hmm? Not the segments. The lingula. Lingula. The left lung has two lobes, but it also has a section right here called the lingula. The lingula. The computer still ain't working. It ain't working on it. Still. Well, I don't know where it's actually. You want to get one from him? They supposed to have. Uh, I ain't want to miss nothing. Mm -hmm. And they supposed to have a line of four minutes. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're about to break in a second. Okay. I'll get on break. All right. So the left lung has two lobes, but it also has a little section here called the lingula, right? But each lobe has segments, and that's what you got to make sure you memorize. What segments belong to which lung and which lobe? Okay. All right. Let's take a 10 minute break. It is 8.55. So that clock, I gotta get another battery. Come back at come back at, at 10 after. Just come back at 10 after. We're gonna finish up this PowerPoint and start our review questions. You up. I'm gonna pause the recording while we take, take a quick break. All right, well, it's, it's gonna be recorded, so you need to go back to this little point right here, you can. All right, so we're back, guys, um, finishing up this PowerPoint, talking about the lung and the thorax. You have the different plural, right? You have the parietal plural and the visceral plural. And then you have the space in between them is called the plural cavity or the plural space. Don't forget that the parietal, parietal plural is the plural that actually um, lines the rib cage, okay? That's the lining of the rib cage, okay? And then the visceral plural is the one that's actually touching the lungs, okay, or the organs, right? 
In between those two, there's a little bit of fluid called serous, S-E-R-O-U-S, serous fluid in that pleural space. And all it's for is to prevent friction, right? Prevent, because you got the ribs moving and your lungs moving, right? In and out and side by side. So we got to make sure we have that serous fluid in place so we don't build up friction. All right. Then we have the hilum. Don't forget about the hilum. The hilum is simply uh, the only in and out of the lungs. Everything that goes into the lungs goes in at the hilum. Kind of like the, the gate, the gate of the lung. Nothing goes in and out the lungs unless it goes in through the hilum, also known as the root. Okay, also known as the root. All right, then we talked about the bony thorax. We showed you that, uh, how you have your first seven ribs or your true rib. Then eight through 12 are also known as false ribs, right? Uh, but the main thing of it is you have your sternum, the top part of the sternum. That's where the sternum is broken down into three parts. The manubrium, which is the, up here, the body, which is here, and the xiphoid process, which is that little bullet looking piece right there. Uh, that's one reason why your hand placement doing CPR is so important. When you're compressing and doing compressions, you're up in the bed doing compression. Uh, hand placement is important because if you break that xiphoid process off, it's like a bullet now, right? And you're pushing it down into the lungs and into the whatever that's right there, right? Liver or whatever else it breaks off and goes into. So it's very important that you have correct hand placement uh, when you're doing some CPR compressions, okay? <clears throat> now, we said there were some landmarks, right? Some specific landmarks of the sternum. The point in between the manubrium and the body, there's a little crack, right? It's not really a crack, it's like a little indention there, okay? And that indention is called the angle of Lewis, right? That's the angle of Lewis. Is it the same one for your email, right? Like when you check your email, you're not, uh, I don't think it's the right place to put it, but I don't know where to put it. It might be, is it time for a visitor? No. It's the what about your what about your hotspot? Can you use your hotspot through your phone? If not, I turn mine on. I can turn mine on for you. Don't let don't let it frustrate It's all good. All right, I'm cutting mine on now. It's gonna probably say iPhone. My hotspot ID is hotspot seventy eight. Might say I'm in Ra's iPhone, or might just say iPhone. Okay, we'll say iPhone. Okay, hit that one, and if you have to put the code in, it's hot spot 78. Yeah, you connect it. All right. So we got the maneuverium, right? And then the little crack in between the maneuverium and the body is the angle of Lewis. What's um, significant about the angle of Lewis is if I was to be able to stick my finger through the angle of Lewis, I will be touching the what? Carina, or the left and right main stem bronchus bifurcate. That's where the carina is, behind the angle of Lewis. Okay? Behind the angle of Lewis. Then we talked about the mediastinum. And in your notes, it tells you the mediastinum. You need to know what all is inside that mediastinum. It's the heart, the great vessels, lymphatic structures, stuff like that. There's a list of things that are in the mediastinum. It's just simply the little media area uh, in the thorax. What is this right here, down here? This right here, this muscle. Diaphragm. This is the diaphragm down here. It's going to drop and that's what's going to suck those lungs open right it it it, it descends 
and it sucks the lungs open, right? It makes the pressure inside the chest more negative. We said in physics, gas runs away from what? Pressure. So liquid and gas follow the path of least resistance, okay? So if the lungs have a lower pressure than ambient, then the air has to go in. And when we relax and we're about to exhale, the air and I mean, the pressure inside the thorax is greater than the pressure outside, so the air goes away. Has to, okay? But that's the job of the diaphragm, coming down and sucking those lungs open by a negative force, all right? Negative, which is natural. That's the natural way. All right, then we talked about the goblet cells. We said goblet cells produce gobs and gobs of what? Mucus. Uh, if we're looking at the uh, a cross section of the inner airway, um, we're looking at the mucus layer here, also known as the mucus blanket, right? Then we have our cells here that have a few of these white ones are your goblet cells. And then those little hairs at the top of the cells are called what? Cilia, the cilia. And the cilia beat in one direction, moving this blanket up toward the mouth. Okay, so you can cough out anything that it has caught. All right. Then in the lamina propria, that's where some of the nerves and stuff like that would be, some of the other uh, cells, mast cells, macrophages, eosinophils, stuff like that will be found in the lamina propria. And then what are these cells down here? What are these cells called? These are glands. What kind of glands are they? What's, what's the name of that gland? It also produces mucus. Two things that, that make mucus, goblet cells and the submucosal glands. Goblet cells and the submucosal glands, sub, right, the under there. They also produce mucus, okay? You on? No. Okay. And so the mucus blanket here uh, is just another picture of what you just saw, just a little closer, right? The mucus blanket, right? It's showing it moves in one direction. They don't beat back and forth. They, everything is beating toward the mouth, okay? So you have your cilia. These are your cells, and then you have these goblet cells every now and then, right? And they produce mucus all day long. About how much mucus is produced a day? 150 mLs a day. ML is the same thing as cc. mLs and cc's are the same. That's the same thing, okay? Then we started getting into the diaphragm, talking about the diaphragm. We said the diaphragm is the major muscle of ventilation. Major muscle of ventilation. We talked about how much does it decrease or, or does it flatten during normal breathing? How much? Anybody remember? How much does it decrease um, during normal? Because they can go down to six to 10 centimeters. If we're breathing hard, the diaphragm can descend up to six to 10 centimeters, right? For, for labored breathing. But for normal breathing, it only descends how much? 1.5, so one and a half, yeah. One and a half centimeters. That's normal, uh, normal contraction of the diaphragm, okay? Normal contraction of the diaphragm. All right. Then we get into our accessory muscles. All right, so accessory muscles. We said that we have accessory muscles in the event that, um, turn your something down, Bobby. Uh, in the event that the diaphragm and the internal and external intercostal muscles are not enough, we can now use extra muscles, right? The accessory muscles, which will be the sternocleoid mastoid muscle, this big one here, and it, helps by directly lifting up the manubrium, right? The sternum. Helps by lifting up that sternum, right? Trying to give you some help. It also uh, have the scalene group, 
the scalene muscle will lift the upper rib and the clavicle, right? Help lift the clavicle and the upper ribs, right? To help open you up, okay? Those are some of the accessory muscles. Make sure in your reading you look at all of them and how they work. Now, don't forget the inverse relationship of the intercostal muscle. They're inverse relationships. So the external intercostal muscles help with what? Inspiration. And the internal intercostals help with expiration. That's inverse, okay? Inverse. So all we're trying to do is make the AP diameter, which is anterior to posterior diameter, wider, right? To breathe. If you can't breathe, we want to get those that the anterior and posterior diameter of the rib cage bigger. Okay? We want to make it so that lungs have more room to fill up because evidently what's filling up is not enough for your metabolism. It's not keeping up. Either you out of shape and uh, your muscles are using a whole lot of oxygen. See, when you're not in shape, the muscles have to use more oxygen to produce the same product somebody else does with minimal, right? But that's the only reason you breathe fast is to get more oxygen in and blow off more what? CO2. But once you become, you get your metabolism right, and you get in shape, then you're not have, you're not producing as much CO2 because your muscles are not having to work as hard. Okay, somebody who has never ran a day in their life cannot go out there and run five miles without stopping. Body just not going to do it. Okay, somebody else can run five miles and not and not be nothing for them. Get up, jog five miles, and come on back home. No problem. Get a runner high and everything. Okay, but their body is prepared for that. And so some of us have a um, not in shape, we have to have more, right? So the body's saying, what you doing? You ain't never ran no five miles, you, what, what you doing, right? Oh, let me let me get the sternum cleomastoid together. Come on, pull that sternum up. Let me get the scalene root. Now you're doing too much. I ain't gonna do all this this morning, right? So now I got to do all this extra work. Heart having to beat harder, right? Now the heart said, well, well hell, let me, let me beat harder then. What, what's going on, okay? And so that's what the body's trying to do. It's accessory. It's, it's helping you get the breath in, okay? So like a football player, when you get the wind knocked out of you, they lift up the, chest, the uh, shoulder pads. They come and lift them up off of you a little bit because you didn't got the wind knocked out, so we're trying to let you breathe again, right? So that's what we're doing, okay? That's what we're doing. Those are accessory muscles. Now, what are all the muscles we use for forced exhalation? If I'm blowing out a candle, I'm using what muscles? The abdominals. The abdominal muscles are used for forced exhalation, not just regular exhalation, but force. So you see how it's showing you right here, in the internal intercostal muscles help with exhalation, but for forced exhalation, we gotta deep into or dig into these abdominal muscles here, okay? The abdominal muscles help with force. So if I'm blowing out birthday candles, I'm using my stomach, okay? Using, right? That's the proper way to do it. Now, you don't have to remember every part of the abdominal muscles. Just know that the abdominal group is for forced exhalation. You don't have to say, remember that it's rectus abdominis and external obliques and all of that, okay? All right, this is just another kind of picture of some accessory muscles and uh, muscles used for forced inhalation. If I'm gonna use a forced inhalation, then I'm gonna have to kick in my uh, accessory muscles, okay? But the major muscle of ventilation is the what? Diaphragm, please don't miss that question. The major, most important muscle in ventilation is the diaphragm. And it gets helped by the intercostal muscle, right? And if that ain't enough, then we kick in with the accessory muscle. Okay? Now, you didn't see oh, on this one, it's not talking about the pectoralis muscle and the trapezius muscle. Uh, those work in conjunction with each other. Uh, and that's called tripoding. If I'm if I'm tripoding with somebody you might see at the grocery store that has to have the cart, they have put both their elbows on the cart when they're walking. Uh, usually the smokers and stuff like that that have COPD for years. That's how they learn to cope, okay? Uh, when they're washing dishes, they may have their elbows on the sink, okay? Uh, because either their back is hurting or they have an issue with breathing, okay? 
Uh, that's called tripod. You go in the patient's room and he has both his elbows up on the bedside table, sitting on the side of the bed. He's tripoding, okay? And what that does is once both elbows or arms are stable, the trapezius muscle will stabilize the head and then the pectoralis muscles kick in as an accessory. Your pecs, your chest muscles. They don't kick in unless your arms are stable and the trapezius muscle is holding the head, okay? And then the chest muscles can help lift and expand that chest cavity. All right, then we had the types of breathing. The main thing to know is that we have different types of breathing. Uh, normal inspiration, normal in, normal out looks like this. That's eupnea, right? The term for normal breathing is eupnea, right? What's the term for fast breathing? Tachypnea, if it's okay, let's just say breathing more than 20 is tachypnea, right? Breathing less than 12 is bradypnea, right? Now, if I'm breathing 50 times a minute, I'm doing what? Hyperventilating. And if I'm breathing one time a minute, I'm hypoventilating. Now, let's use a layers question. Don't forget your AKA. I said CO2, AKA respiratory, AKA ventilation, AKA acid, AKA carbia, AKA capnia, right? Now, let's think about those last two. Let's think of uh, capnia. Let's just think of the word capnia, right? There you go, Ms. Tommy, you're in now. Let's think of the word capnia, okay? Now, if, tell me what, we have. <laughs> if I'm hyperventilating, then what's my capnia status? Hyper or hypo? <laughs> so let me let me say it again. I want to know what's the capnia status. Capnia is either hypercapnia or hypocapnia, because capnia is CO2, right? Okay. If you know that, then if a person is hyperventilating, that's going to make them what? Not hypercapnic, hypocapnic, because they're blowing off too much CO2, okay? If a person is hypoventilating, then makes them hypercapnic, okay? All right, so keep that in mind. So hyperventilation can cause hypocapnia, all right? And hypoventilation can cause hypercapnia, all right? So that's your COPD patient, ma'am. Yeah, so this is what I'm saying. We exhale CO2, right? So if I'm hyperventilating, I'm blowing off too much what? Okay, and if CO2 is capnia, then what is my state? If I'm blowing off too much, now my capnia level is what? Low, so hypocapnia, right? So hyperventilation causes hypocapnia, okay? Now, what if I'm not breathing fast? What if I'm breathing super, super, super slow? If I'm hypoventilating, I'm not blowing off enough CO2, right? So then that means it's going to make me hypercapnic, a high CO2, okay? And that's what the problem is with your COPD patients. COPD patients cannot get the air out, so they have chronic levels of high what? CO2. So they're always hypercapnic. Your, C your COPD patients are always hypercapnic. Always. Because they can't get the hair out. They always have a high CO2. Hypercapnic. Okay? You got it? They always have that. And it's permissible. We call it permissive hypercapnia because we know that's their function. That's just how they live. And you're going to find out when we get to O2 and all of that why they live that way and if we fix them what could happen we can kill them if we get them like us if we say oh your your oxygen is low and your co2 is high let me fix that if i don't know the history of my patient and i fix that and make their oxygen level like yours now you're about to kill them okay because they live to be hypoxic hypoxic means low oxygen in the blood that's how they live. Once the body senses that they're hypoxic, it makes them breathe. They say, okay, we hypoxic today, breathe. We hypoxic today, good, breathe. But tomorrow, we ain't hypoxic no more, all right, well, we ain't gonna breathe. That's how they live. 
because they have destroyed their chemo receptor, the central chemo receptors from smoking. Okay, and we'll learn that when we get to that. Okay, so hyperventilation gives you hypocapnia. Okay, and hypoventilation will cause hypercapnia. All right, or hypercarbia or hyper acid, right? Because it's all the same thing. All right. Don't worry about this obstructive one. Bradypenia is slow breathing, less than 12, right? Who's malls is fast and deep, fast and deep. When somebody's having a diabetic acidosis, they're just breathing deep and fast, deep and fast, because the body is trying to compensate for that metabolic acidosis, okay? Die, metabolic acidosis, the body, the lungs will try to compensate for that, okay? And like I said, we're gonna learn more about compensation when we get into ABGs. And then Shane Stokes is uh, changing rates and depths and then pe with periods of apnea. So it might be breathe, 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 stop. Breathe, 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 stop, All right? It does that for, <laughs> forever, it keeps doing that. That's a trademark. Chain stokes. Okay. Now, our medullary centers, don't forget those medullary centers we talked about. We have the uh, respiratory groups, respiratory centers, right? We got the pons and we have the medullary centers. Okay. Uh, in the pons, you have the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center, right? And then in the medullary respiratory centers, we have the dorsal group and the ventral group. All right, so make sure you look in your notes to see uh, what all ones do what. All right, let me uh, let me pull that one up right quick if I can find it. All right. Here go those medullary centers again. You had your medullary center. We have the medulla, and it contains the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group. Remember, the dorsals have mainly inspiratory neurons there. And they send signals to the diaphragm via the what nerve? Phrenic. The phrenic, that's all right. The phrenic nerve comes from the dorsal respiratory group from the brain to the diaphragm. It makes the diaphragm contract, right? Not only the diaphragm, but the external intercostals because external intercostals help with inspiration. The ventral respiratory groups have both inspiratory and expiratory neurons. Right, and what they do is they uh, the inspiratory neurons will abduct the vocal cords, which makes them bigger, right? Which increases the diameter of the glottis, because we said the hole in between the vocal cords, the hole that leads into the lower airway is the glottis, right? That's the hole in between the vocal cords, the glottis. All right, and so those inspiratory neurons of the ventral group, so look right here, will spread the vocal cords open, abduct them, spread them open, and increase the diameter of the glottis, okay? And then uh, <clears throat> it also will innervate the diaphragm and the external intercostals. Then the expiratory neurons of that group send impulses to the internal intercostals and the abdominal muscles, because abdominal muscles are used for forced exhalation, and the internal intercostals are used for regular ex exhalation. Okay, abdominal muscles are for forced exhalation and the internal intercostals are for regular exhalation, all right? Then you have those pontines. The pontines are on the, uh, above the medulla on the brainstem. And we talked about the video yesterday, so I was about the apneustic center and the pneumotaxic center. Apneustic center allows for a prolonged inspiration. It makes you be able to inspire longer for a yarn or a sigh or whatever it is you want to inspire long for, right? 
it lets it do that. But the pneumotaxis center is checks and balance. All right. So when you start inhaling, it can only inhale so far, right? The pneumotaxis center will send a signal saying, hey, that's enough. But what tells the pneumotaxis center that that's enough? How does the pneumotaxis center know when enough is enough for that lung? When that lung is just opening up, how does the pneumotaxis center know that that's enough? What, there's some receptors on the lungs. What are those receptors on the lungs we talked about? Heron Brewer, the Heron Brewer reflex, stretch receptors. So once that lung starts stretching, the, the stretch receptors say, hey, that's enough, right? So the Heron Brewer reflex are the stretch receptors that send a signal to the pneumotaxic center saying that's enough. And pneumotaxic center will then say, abnusic center, cut it off. It's firing, right? There's nerves and there's signals being fired all over in these between these two respiratory centers that control your breathing. And it's not like a big deal. It's just, that's how it works. I start taking a deep breath in and keep on. My lungs are going to start stretching. When those stretch receptors are activated, they send a signal to the pneumotaxic center saying, hey, this is enough. We're stretched to the limit. And pneumotaxic center will say, roger that. And then we'll tell abnusic center, cut it off. And you'll stop. Okay? That's how it works. Like a chain of command. Okay? Like a chain of command. Now, we said those stress receptors, which are the heron viewer reflex, right? That heron viewer reflex are the stretch receptors in the smooth muscles of, and the small and large airways. Now, the amount of volume in the lungs in regular breathing is tidal volume, which is how much? 500. 500 ml or 0.5 liters, right? But if I go until I start stretching, I can produce up to how much? 800 to what? 1,000 ml, okay? 800 to 1,000 ml if I keep on inspiring to stretch capacity, right? If I start stretching. But normal in and out is about 500, okay? Now, the next level we get to, which is pulmonary mechanics, you're going to be learning about, I'm going to show you the spirogram. Okay, and you're gonna have to learn, memorize how to draw the spirogram, which shows you total lung capacity. It's gonna show you tidal volume, then inspiratory reserve volume, right? And then it's gonna show you expiratory reserve volume and residual volume. Those are volumes. And then you have capacities, inspiratory capacity, and functional residual capacity, which is FRC. Then you have vital capacity, right? And they're gonna be like, it's gonna ask you questions like, IRV plus VT equal what? You want to know that that's inspiratory capacity, all right? And so that's what the spirogram is all about. It's a square that has these little boxes, okay? And you're gonna learn, memorize how to write just like you did the blood flow through the heart. You're gonna memorize it and not have a problem with it, but you can't play with it, okay? You, you gotta study it because you gotta know not only what it is and be able to explain it, but how much is it, okay? Just like you did tidal volume today. Tidal volume is normal inspiration and normal, the gas that's moved between normal in and normal out. And the amount is 0.5 liters, okay? Same thing you gotta do about inspiratory reserve volume. Oh, inspiratory reserve volume is the maximum amount of air that I can inhale after a normal inhalation. So I'll go up normal and stop and then keep on, and that will be my inspiratory reserve volume. And you gotta know what it is, but we're not learning that right now. I'm just showing that's what's coming up, okay? That with the alveolar equation, all that stuff is coming up on the next lesson. All right, so that is that part. Uh, that breath sounds stuff we showed you yesterday, just remember that, go over that sheet that I gave you because it's not in here. Uh, that sheet that's already in your note-taking guide. The breath sounds is already in your note-taking guide under this section, okay? All right, so it is 9.45, just take a 10-minute break and we're gonna come back to practice orals. We're going to practice some of these orals, and then I'm going to put up a couple of worksheets for RT210C, and then we're going to be done. Okay, so I'm going to pause now, take your 10-minute break, come back, and we're going to clear your desk, and I'm going to ask you oral questions. Okay? And you can kind of see how you're doing, because when you take your orals, you won't have any notes or anything like that out. And if you've been studying B and A and all of that, you should be good. You gone? Yeah, I think you Today. Oh, okay. I know I just Okay, guys, at this point, 
I'm going to pause the video, uh, but I'm going to leave the Zoom up, but I'm going to pause the video and we're going to start uh, after break, oral question practice, uh, oral question practice. So I will record while I'm doing that. You'll hear me ask questions and you'll hear me, uh, their uh, students answer questions and you know go from there, explain different things. Uh, but that's what we're going to do next. After that, I may put up a uh, alternate test or alternate quiz or something and just let you answer those questions as classwork. And then we'll see you all and you'll be practicing over the weekend, preparing for Monday's exam. After the exam Monday, we were going to jump right into pulmonary mechanics. And it's a lot to pulmonary mechanics. So have this together. If you did not pass the last test, make sure you email me the answers to that practice and review for cardiac AMP by the time you take the test. So if you email it to me Monday morning at seven in the morning, whatever, it's fine. As long as I have it from you before I open your test for the next one, okay? All right, so after the break, we'll be back with oral practice. All right, we're back from break, guys. Now we're gonna do a little practice oral exam question. So if you don't know, just say, I don't know. Because if you just, you know, cause we gotta try to get through as many as we can, okay? And so if I, you know, you take forever on each one, then we, we can't cover a lot of them, okay? And so just, I'm giving you some time and try to think of it. But if you just don't know that one, just say, I don't know, I'm gonna go to the next person. And I'm just gonna go down the line like this. So it'll be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? And then back around, okay? Shuffle them up. These are only questions from um, 210 A, B, C, okay? That's it. When we do, when we get to D and finish that, then I'll add D to the stack, switch them up and practice that way. And I'll add E to the stack and practice that way. It might not be as much because I take some of them out, but it'll be a mixture. You just keep adding to it. So that way when you get to the end, you have practiced some of these, right? And I say, don't try to memorize these questions because in memory of failure, but these are the exact questions you're going to get on the oral. I'm not giving you another whole set. Okay, these are the questions. So if you try to memorize, it ain't going to work because you don't know which ones you're going to be asked and you're going to be nothing in front of you. I mean, unless you got a photographic memory or telepathic memory. You know what I'm saying? You're not hurt. You're not helping yourself. So when you get out there in the field, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to show. And when you take the board exam, you definitely ain't gonna have nothing then. So, you know, you wanna pay that $500 or $400 every time you take that test, that's on you. Because Concord will pay for your first board exam, which is $400. Concord pays you. If you fail it, you must take it again and pay for it on your own. And if you fail it too many times, like three times, you have to pay RT over again, the whole program. Okay, they're not paying. So, Cheating to get, I'm just going to mom, you know, I'm going to, it's not going to do nothing to hurt you. You pay $40,000 for the program and you got to take it. All right, so that's wasting time. Okay, go ahead and take this time to be 100% with it so that you can chill when you're done. You got it, you know the information, and you professional, have this professional job that you want. You might be already professional, but evidently you want this job because it's you in the class. Okay. And so you work smart, not hard. But if you trick your way through, it's going to show up at the end. Okay? All right. Mr. Rivers, the question is measurements. Okay? 10 tor equals how many millimeters of mercury? 10 tor is how many millimeters of mercury? Not sure, anybody? Yeah. Remember, tor and millimeters of mercury are the same. Tor and millimeters of mercury are the same, just like milliliters and cc. All right, good job. That's, that's, we haven't gotten to that yet. All right. Ms. Renfro, cardiac anatomy. Cardiac anatomy. The chamber that pumps arterial blood through the aortic valve. What chamber pumps the blood through the aortic valve? 
Left ventricle, good. All right, Ms. Rose, pulmonary anatomy. Pulmonary anatomy. What is the primary muscle of ventilation? Primary muscle of ventilation. Most important muscle of all the muscles for ventilation. What's the most important? No, that's the organ. Anybody else? Diaphragm. I know you knew that. Diaphragm. Don't be nervous. All right. You ready? Oh, no, it's you. It's going to be you. It's done. Uh, you're Thomas Scott. And you're Thomas. Okay. I think I said Scott to you earlier. I'm sorry. All right. Ms. Cummings, pulmonary anatomy. What are the primary sources of mucus? What two structures make mucus? Not sure, anybody? Submucosal glands and goblet cells. So they make gobs and gobs of mucus, right? Yeah. Goblet cells. Hmm? Submucosal glands. Yeah, submucosal glands. All right, Ms. Scott. Cardiac anatomy. Name one of the chambers of the heart and does it provide pulmonary or systemic circulation? Left ventricle, systemic, excellent. All right, you ready, Ms. Fleming? Describe the electrical conduction pathway of the heart. The electrical pathway. SA no, AV no, bundle of his. Before the oldest, left and, yeah, left and right bundle branches and then the, excellent. All right. I know that one yet. All right, Ms. Thomas. Thomas, what is the function of arteries? What do arteries do? Huh? Then we got arteries and we have veins. The arteries do what? What do which okay? The arteries carry blood which way? To the heart or away from the heart? Huh? Away from the heart. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood to the heart. All right? It's the rivers. Terminology. The directional term anterior means what? In the front. Ms. Renfro, cardiac anatomy. Define systole. Contraction of which chamber? You got the contraction right, but which chamber am I feeling with the pulse? Just the ventricles. Contraction of the ventricle is systole. Systole is the top number of the blood pressure, and that's the depolarization or the squeeze or the contraction of the ventricle. Okay, that's what your that's what systole is. Okay. All right, Ms. Rose, what is the normal range for hemoglobin? Hemoglobin, 12 to 15 or 12 to 16 grams. That's male and female. Good. All right. Ready? Uh, what is the formula to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit? So Fahrenheit equals what? Fahrenheit equals 9 divided by 5. Plus One was different. Uh, times Celsius yeah, plus, plus 32. Good. Nine over five times Celsius plus 32. Excellent. All right. Ms. Scott, pulmonary anatomy. Name one of the three cells of alveolar. Name one of the three types of alveolar cell and its function. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Good. And which number are they? Type three, massive body. The question was name one of the types of alveolar cells and its function. Uh huh. Uh huh. All right, Ms. Fleming. The blood. What does CBC mean? Complete blood count. 
All right, you ready, Ms. Thomas? What is the AARC and what do they do? Good. Good. So they promote the profession. AARC is American uh, Association of Respiratory Care. They promote the profession. Uh, they do. They give us clinical practice guidelines. They give us governmental representation. They go to Congress for you. Okay, for your for this profession. AARC. All right, Mr. Rivers, pulmonary anatomy. Name the only complete ring of the trachea. Only complete ring of the trachea. What's it called? Not sure? Anybody else? Prideful. Yeah. You just say it out. Whenever somebody doesn't get an ask, you just say it. That's fine. Prideful. You got it? Prideful cartilage. Mr. Renfro, terminology. What does PRN mean? As needed. Ms. Rose, cardiac anatomy. Define diastole. Of the good. repolarization or relaxation of the ventricle. All right. So that's why we have coming. Coming. So Fleming's and coming. Okay. Because I keep wanting to mix y'all up. Pulmonary anatomy. Name the lobes of the right lung. The lobes, not the segments, just the lobes. Right, upper mm -hmm. lung, right middle lung, Good. right lower lung. Excellent. <clears throat> Ms. Scott, what are the three types of fluid in the body and where are they found? Intracellular, intracellular, and where is that? Inside the cell. You just said intracellular. You already said intracellular. What's the other one? So it's two more. Intracellular is inside the cell. Mm -hmm. Interstitial, where is that? In between the cells. And then finally, intravascular, and it's inside the blood, it's inside the what? Vessel. So intravascular is inside the vessel, interstitial is in between the cells, and intracellular is inside the cell. That's the three types of fluid in the body. Okay. All right. Ms. Fleming, cardiac anatomy. What is sinus bradycardia? Sinus bradycardia. Anybody? A slow heart rate less than what? 60. So you got to know that. Any heart rate that is less than 60 is sinus bradycardia. Okay, bradycardia less than 60, tachycardia greater than 100, 60 to 100. Okay, now depending on where you are, some patients know. Numbers are a little bit different. All right, oh, yeah. Ms. Thomas, the blood. What is the normal red blood cell count? I don't know that one. Anybody remember that one? That's white blood. Five to ten thousand is white blood count. What's what's red blood count? It's in the millions. Mm -hmm. 4.2 to 6.2 million. Red blood cells, 4.2 to 6.2 million. Of course, there's more men than there are women, but both of those combined is 4.2 to 6.2 million. Okay. 
red blood cell. All right, Mr. Mr. Rivers, pulmonary anatomy. Define the parietal pleural. The parietal pleural. Remember, we got two plura. We got the parietal plural and the visceral plural. What is the parietal plural? Anybody? The rib cage. The lining of the actual rib cage. So it says outside lining that covers the thorax. Okay, it covers the thorax. The parietal. And the visceral on the lung. Yeah. So as I said, Mr. McCarthy makes the best barbecue parietal ribs. Huh? No, the, the visceral pleural is the one is the lining that covers the organ. So the lung itself has a little lining of the visceral pleural. And the rib cage inside the rib cage is lined with the parietal pleural. Okay. All right. Ms. Renfro, name the segments of the right upper lobe. Right upper lobe has three segments. What are they? Not sure. Anybody know? Apical, posterior, and anterior. Yeah. So that's why I tell you, you got to you memorize them, those segments. Okay? Segments of the right upper lobe apical, posterior, and anterior. All right, Ms. Rose. Segments. Name the segments in the right lower lobe. Five of them. Superior. Medial basal. Anterior basal. Uh huh. Posterior basal, but one more on the side. Side mean. What does side mean? Lateral. Good. You you good. Superior, medial basal, anterior basal, lateral basal, posterior basal. Those are the segments of the right lower lobe. Excellent. All right. It's coming. Terminology. What does SOB mean? Shortness of breath. I'm Miss Scott. Pulmonary anatomy. Define the visceral pleural. Lining of the lung or the organ. Good. All right. Ms. Fleming, terminology. What does TID, T is in Tommy, what does TID mean? Three times a day. All right. Ms. Uh, Thomas, what, oh, this is the blood. What is the normal potassium level? 3.5 to 5. Nice. No, 3.5 to 5. Milli equivalents per liter. You got to know that part. Milli equivalents per liter. Okay. Good. All right, Mr. Rivers. What does terminology? What does NPO mean? When a patient is NPO, they usually have it before surgery. When I'm going to have surgery the next morning, I'll make them NPO that night. Not it. Nothing by mouth. Nothing by mouth. PO means by mouth. Right? All right. Good. Ms. Renfro, the blood. What is the normal white blood cell count? Five to 10,000. All right, Ms. Rose. Name the segments. Of the left lower low. I'm just going right down the list. I swear I am. <laughs> Name the segments of the you got these segments. That's that's good. Left lower low. Left lower low. There's four of them. Is it No. Superior. Remember the left 
lower lobe and right lower lobe both have a superior sex in the back. Okay. So superior, what else? Three more. Anterior medial. No. So it's superior, anterior, I mean anterior medial, lateral basal, and posterior basal. Yeah, yeah. She got them. She got them. She got them segments. That's good. That's how you have to be able to do these segments, yeah. Because not only do you got to know them, because when we get into drainage, I say, how do you drain the superior segment of the left lower lobe? How would you face your patient? They need to be prone because it's in the back. But if you don't know what the segments are, nothing, you have no idea how to drain it. Okay? All right. Uh, it's coming. Pulmonary anatomy. What is the purpose of the gel layer? On that mucus blanket, there's a gel layer and there's a sole layer. What's the purpose of the gel layer? Not sure. Anybody? Catch the form. Catch the uh, uh, foreign particles. Don't say yeah. Don't say this yourself. Because it's okay to be wrong. If you're wrong, you're just wrong. That's all right. We practice. But the gel layer will trap the foreign particles, right? And the sole layer is more liquidy, which has the cilia in it, right? And the cilia beats and push that whole blanket up. Good. All right, Miss Scott. Terminology. What does COPD mean? Mean? What's it stand for? COPD. We didn't really talk about it much, but it is one of those and one of them acronyms on that one of the pages that you have in your notes for 210A. Okay. Yeah, disease. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But if you said disorder, they would have got it. Okay, got it? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. And COPD has CBAE diseases. You're going to learn all the diseases that are encompassed in COPD. Okay, we'll learn it later. All right. Ms. Fleming, pulmonary anatomy. What nerve stimulates the diaphragm? No, no, anybody remember? Phrenic, the phrenic nerve. Yep, the phrenic nerve sends the signal from the brain to the diaphragm to contract. All right, good. All right, Ms. Thomas, terminology. What are we on do? MDI. I don't think we talked about that one yet. That's coming more in, in uh, pharmacology. MDI is the little pumper. It's called a meter dose inhaler. I'm going to give you another one. All right. What does the NBRC do? And what does it stand for? National Board for Respiratory Care, NBRC. Okay. And they're responsible for testing. That's all you got to know. All right. That's what you go sit before when you take the board exam, it's the NBRC. All right. All right, Mr. Rivers, pulmonary anatomy. Okay. Why does aspiration occur mostly in the right lung? So if you something go down the wrong pipe, why does it usually always go in the right lung instead of the left? Not sure? Straighter and wider. Yeah, it has a straighter route and a larger diameter. <laughs> That's all right. This is this exercise, guys, is to show you that you have to go back. You have to go back and study those other ones and keep them. You know, when you're studying the regular, go back, study that stuff again. Highlight whatever you need, flash cards, whatever you need to do, okay, because they ain't going nowhere. Ms. Renfro, cardiac anatomy. Where does the normal cardiac stimulus begin? The stimulus. So we talked about the electrical conduction. Where does it start? The stimulus start? SA no. So that's the same kind of question. It's asked a little different. Okay. All right. 
Ms. Rowe, name the two pressure measurements. Pressures are either measured in what and what? Millimeters of mercury or, that's the same thing as millimeters of mercury. The other one is, centimeters of water. Centimeters of water, CMH2O or MMHD. So the two pressure measurements that we use pressure, measure pressure with, millimeters of mercury and centimeters of water. Okay, millimeters of mercury are usually inside the body, and centimeters of water are usually pressures that we generate. So, if I give you some CPAP, right, it's usually eight centimeters of water, 10 centimeters of water, whatever I'm adding pressure to you. But pressures like in the vessels and stuff like that are millimeters of mercury. Okay, that's one way to kind of remember. All right, Ms. Cummings, pulmonary anatomy. Pulmonary anatomy. Define pulmonary surfactant. What is pulmonary surfactant? Anybody tell them, tell them what some, uh, surfactant is? It helps with elasticity. It, de it decreases the surface tension. It's a detergent-like phospholipid that regulates the surface tension of the alveoli. Okay, and what part, what cell makes it? Type two cell. Type two cells of the alveoli produce surfactant, and that surfactant is like a soapy-like liquid that decreases the surface tension of the alveoli. Therefore, one large alveoli can communicate through collateral ventilation with a smaller alveoli and not suck it in. Okay. All right. What was that? Okay. All right, Ms. Scott, pulmonary anatomy. What is the prime function of the lung? Huh? To ventilate, but what's the word we, we said? I highlighted it in everything. Prime function of the lung is external respiration. Perfect. All right, Ms. Fleming, cardiac anatomy. The blood leaving the right atrium passes through which valve? What is it? Tricuspid. Tricuspid valve. All right, Ms. Thomas, the blood. What is the normal calcium level? Mm -hmm. Milli equivalents per liter. Excellent. 4.25 to 5.25 milli equivalents per liter. All right, Mr. Rivers, cardiac anatomy. What does the P wave of the EKG mean? The P wave. Huh? Not sure? The P wave. We got P Q R S T. P Q R S T. So the P wave is what is what? Atrial. Atrial depolarization. That's the contraction of the atrium. So what happens is the atrial contracts and then the QRS is the ventricle contracts. And then the T is when the ventricle relaxes. Okay? So the P wave is atrial depolarization or at atrial squeeze or atrial contraction. And the QRS is the ventricle depolarization, AKA squeeze or contract. And the T wave is when the ventricle repolarizes or relaxes, okay? All right, Ms. Renfro, terminology. What does stat mean? Now, immediately, okay, immediately. All right, Ms. Rose. Segments, I'm explaining. <laughs> the blood, the blood. What is the normal chloride level? Chloride. Anybody? 
96 to 105 milli equivalents per liter. So you know the segments and she knows the. <laughs> so, so that's. <laughs> yeah, 96 to 105 milli equivalents per liter. So I know we. All right. So, Ms. Cummings, segments. Um, Name the segments in the left upper lobe. The left upper lobe has four segments. What are they? No, no menials, man. Anybody else know? Anybody? Anterior? Apical posterior. Inferior lingual up. No. Superior lingual. So here they are. The segments in the left upper lobe. Apical posterior, anterior, superior lingula, and inferior lingula. All right? All right. Oh, yeah. Ms. Flemings, what's the formula to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius? Celsius? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. What is the uh, <laughs> what is the formula to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius? Celsius equals what? Now, none over five. There you go. Uh huh. Now, Celsius, we, we, Fahrenheit, that's all right. Excellent. Five over nine times Fahrenheit minus 32. But don't forget the Fahrenheit minus 32 is in parentheses. You must do that first in order to do it right. Otherwise, it's going to be wrong. Your answer is going to come out wrong. All right, now, Ms. Fleming. Oh, we, don't, we haven't done that one. Cardiac anatomy. What is sinus tachycardia? Tachycardia. Okay. So heart rate greater than greater than hundred. Excellent. All right. Oh, I got that one yet. Don't need that one yet. Okay. Miss Thomas, measurements. What's the normal blood pressure? 120 over 80 what? Millimeters of mercury or tor. Excellent. All right, Mr. Rivers, pulmonary anatomy. Does internal or external respiration happen in the lungs? External. Renfro, terminology. What does the MBRC mean? What does it stand for? MBRC, what does it stand for? There you go. All right. Ms. Rose, the blood. Give us four purposes of the blood. I got six of them on here, but just give me four. Four responsibilities are the purposes of the blood. What do we say the blood, all the things the blood does? Not sure. Okay, anybody got one? Okay, so uh, transport respiratory gases. Removes the waste. Gives nutrients to the cells. What do the platelets? What did uh huh? Prevents clotting, right? So protects what that's uh, and then circulates the soldiers, right? Circulates defenses. And then also finally electrolytes. Okay. Purpose of the blood transport respiratory gases, circulate the defenses, give nutrients to the cells, remove waste from the cells, uh, help with clotting and electrolytes. That's the blood. Okay. <laughs> That's the blood. All right. Um, Ms. Cummins, the blood. What is the normal sodium level? Normal sodium. Oh, 
No. Anybody else? 135 to 145. If you had seven, that wouldn't, they probably, you might have saw it so much. 135 to 145 daily equivalents per liter. That's the normal sodium level. Good job. All right, Ms. Scott, what is the function of veins? Away from the body, yeah, to the heart. Okay, yeah, you're right. It takes away from the body toward the heart, but I always say carry blood to the heart. Okay, all right. All right, uh, Miss Fleming, cardiac anatomy, almost done. Down to this from what we started with. You're doing yes, excellent. What does the QRS? Represent ventricular um, contraction. contraction. Miss Thomas, what is the normal heart rate? Sixty to one hundred. Some people say eighty to one hundred. So it says sixty to one hundred or eighty to one hundred, depending on which one you say. Oh, uh -huh. um, for baby infants, mm -hmm. heart rate. Yeah, that's what adult we we talking about. When you get to two forty, they're gonna have some a few different values for infants and pediatrics. Okay. All right. Mr. Rivers, cardiac anatomy. So thinking about the blood flow. Name and locate one of the valves of the heart. Okay. So you're going to tell me the valve and where it is in between this and this. That's all you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> Name one of the valves. So just give me a valve of the heart. Okay. Tricuspid valve in between what two? Uh, so tricuspid valve is in between what? Right, right atrium and the right ventricle. Okay. Any, you know another valve? What about the aortic valve? The aortic valve is in between what? Not sure. Left ventricle and and they order. So practice on your blood flow. All right. Ms. Renfro, pulmonary anatomy. Define the cilia. Paralyzed -like structures, not the fossilia, that's the fact. Paralyzed -like structures that do what? Here's the mucus blanket of the escalator. Hair like structures on top of the cell that push the mucus blanket, right? They beat in one direction, moving the mucus up the respiratory tract. All right, Ms. Rose, pulmonary anatomy. What's the top of the lung called? This little point here. What's that called? The apex or apices for both. Good. All right. Ms. Cummings, what's the normal magnesium level? <laughs> Normal <laughs> magnesium. <laughs> <laughs> um, 1.5 to 2.5 equivalents per liter. And that's on that sheet. So make you know, I gave that. And laminated paper, laminated mm, sheet, those values, those are your values. Of all, just focus on the ones that we're talking about because those are values for all the rest of the tour, yeah. okay? But when you see the ones that we're dealing with, then you can go and study those, okay? And then when you get some more, you, because we all use the same sheet, okay? All right, cardiac anatomy. Uh, Ms. Oh, hold on. <laughs> All right, Ms. Scott, name two lethal dysrhythmias. Asystole. Good. V field and asystole. And we also have VTAC and PEA or EMD, right? What are them? Which one? Lethal EKG. Uh, Lethal dysrhythmia that can be dead. Uh huh. Miss Fleming, cardiac anatomy. 
Name one of the three layers of the heart. That's a sack. So give me a layer. Teratarum is right, but that's the sack that the heart is in. What's one of the layers of the actual heart? Myocardium, and that's the muscle, right, in the middle. We also have the outer layer. It's called the outer layer. Epicardium. And the inner layer is the endo. So inner endo, right? Endocardium. All right. Uh, Ms. Uh, Thomas, terminology. What does QID mean? Four times a day. All right. Mr. Rivers, cardiac anatomy. What does the T wave mean on the EKG? The T wave. So we got P, Q, R, S, and then T. What is that T? Repolarization of the. <laughs> so yeah, don't help, don't help. They have to, don't help. All right, all right, Miss Renfro, terminology. Oh, we don't do, haven't done that. One. That's H and M. We'll, we'll learn that one later. Measurements. What does kg mean? Kilogram. And finally, Miss Rose, last one. Miss Rose, what is the approximate length of the trachea? 10 to 12 centimeters or 4.5 to 5.5 inches. Okay. All right. So excellent job, guys. Y'all did better than uh, any of my classes have done on the first goal. Okay. That uh, because that shows that you're studying and you're taking it serious because that's what you want to have to do. We're going to be in pharmacology. We're going to, have to throw gas physics in the mix. We're going to throw ABGs in the mix, right? We're going to throw all this stuff in the mix as we continue to go, okay? Uh, and so practice because when, so when you take your oral, you can get 100 on it or really, really good because the oral is 16% of your grade. These exams we take is 4.5. The exams we take every week, 4.5% of your grade. The, the oral is 16%. And the final is 26%. So those two are pretty heavy, all right? So you got to go back and you got to study. All right. I'm gonna put up some sheets now. You can go log back into your, if you're not on your online, and I'm gonna put up some work, classwork. Work on some of these classwork. Matter of fact, I can put them, well, yeah. I can either put them on the overhead or I can put them on the computer. Which one y'all want? Uh, either or, okay. Well, I'm gonna put it up on the screen then. Share my screen to, uh, let's see here. Let's first look at these MBRC questions. They have the answers, but we're gonna look at a couple of these MBRC questions. These are sample MBRC questions for pulmonary A and P, kind of how they're structured, okay? So number one, number one says, to help you determine whether your patient has orthopnea, you should ask them the following, all right? The answer to that one is C. Do you need to use extra pillars behind your head when you're sleeping? Orthopnea is shortness of breath when laying flat, right? And so, uh, when you're asking your patient to find out if they have orthopnea, you say, well, how many pillars you use when you sleep, Mr. John? Oh, I got to have four or five pillars. If I ain't got four or five pillars, I can't breathe. He has orthopnea, okay? Orthopnea relates to the patient being unable to lie down and breathe comfortably. Extra pillars are needed to raise the head and the body, okay? Number two, in observing an infant's chest configuration, you notice that the same. You notice that it is the same size in both the A and P, the uh, anterior, posterior, and the lateral dimension. So you wouldn't notice yet because it's P. But that's what I say. This MBRC question. Okay. So after you have done everything, you'll learn a little bit more anatomy and physiology about the P. Okay. So you won't be able to answer this one yet. But that answer would be A. A normal chest. An infant's chest is basically round in dimension. But you'll know that when you get to 240. When you talk about the A and P of the child's lungs, okay, so that's why they throw this in because 
NBRC not only going to say, this is from your 210A, right? They're going to know it's the whole program, okay? Let's look at number three. Your call to the ER. Let's see if we know this. Pediatric patient. Um, that's pediatric again. Let's look at this one. All of the following could result in a mediastinal shift on an X-ray film, except for should be B, bilateral lower no pneumonia. Now, a shift on the mediastinal. What did I say will happen if you have a pneumothorax, which is a hole in the lung? Pneumothorax is a hole in the lung. And so if air is coming out of the lung, hitting the parietal pleural, it's going to push the lung back, right? It's going to collapse the lung, and that will shift everything over. Not only that, but if fluid is in the opposite lung, it will shift everything over, okay? So you'll learn that uh, when you get a little farther, too. I just thought maybe this would have some that we can answer. Let's see. Okay, let's try this one. Try number five. A patient who is suffering respiratory distress would exhibit all of the following except what? A, a normal respiratory rate. They will have accessory muscles, right? They will have intercostal retractions, nasal flaring, but they're not gonna have a normal respiratory rate, okay? All right, so that was a little quick one. Uh, gotta be a little farther for those. I thought maybe we could ask. We didn't do this one yet, did we? All right, so this is the first one I want you to work on for classwork. Work on one through six. And you can use your book. You don't have to not use your book. So go ahead and work on one through six, and we'll go over those. Yeah, you can, um, yeah. Well, you got three prong on your computer, ain't it? Is it a three prong or just two? Uh, yeah, you can try to use it right here. I don't, I don't you can see it. Yeah, you see right there. Yeah. Work on one through six. And then we'll go over. When you graduate, guys, this is what they're going to send you in the mail from the NPRC. I'll pass it right. Take pride in it. It's going to be so hard. It's going to work. Not only your certificate, but what do you take? Get the white one. I got the white one. Oh. That's what your all your hard work is to be able to walk around with that patch on me. You are respiratory excellence, and you can work in any department in the hospital. When you see RT, they really don't want you in the ICU. But when you are RT, you high as you can go in respiratory. As high as you can go. It's like a little iron patch. Put it on your, your lap. Oh. Can you get your basket? Yeah, you can get your basket, but you don't you don't know any more information oh. from our arts. Oh. It's just like for rocks. Oh. If you step out each rest when you can, I'm not gonna have a safe break. Okay, you work on your class work. You need to take a break, right? Okay. It's a lot. I I I ain't just telling you work. I just I'm just like my work like that. Very, very slow. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, so the reason why I didn't be here was I was going to my other place. Right. What are your 
Yeah, I need some more light. Y'all good on the light? Okay. A couple more minutes, I'm gonna have to raise it up. But I'll put it in the um I can put it in the canvas for you if you want to you know, don't have some answer or whatever. Don't be afraid, this will be something you can look at. I think it's many left. Let's look at number one. What are the goblet cells and where are they located? They secrete mucus and where are they located? Good, good. What about number two? What are the two pleura that surround the pleural space? Visceral and pleura. Number three, name the three types of alveolar cells and their functions. So type one, gas exchange or gas diffusion. Type two, good, and type three, uh, all right. Give me four key points about surfactant. Okay, decrease the surface tension, prevents alveolar collapse. There it is, continuously produced, secreted, and eliminated. That's important. Continuously produced, secreted, and eliminated. It's all day long. Surfactant is being made, used, secreted, and eliminated. All day long. Number five, what's the composition of mucus? 95% water. Good, good. Something wrong? Oh. And number six, what is the body's normal daily production of this mucus? 150 milliliters. 150 milliliters a day. Last four, seven through 10. Mark on seven through 10. And for number 10, it says, what generation? Just tell me the structure. You don't have to tell me the number, just tell me the structure. I've always got extra max to it, guys.
When those are done, we're going to pull up some more questions that we're going to just do aloud. So see the question, have multiple choice to choose from aloud, okay? All right, number seven, what does the T wave represent? Ventricular repolarization. What are the four lethal dysrhythmias? VTAC, VPIL, asystole, EMD, or PEA. EMD is electrical mechanical dissonance. PEA is pulses electric activity. They're the exact same thing. That just means you have a normal EKG, but the patient has no pulse. EMD or PEA? D as in dog. EMD as in dog or PEA, like P. All right. Number nine, what is the heron viewer reflex? Yes, yeah, so it prevents lung overinflation by stretch receptors. Heron viewer reflex are stretch receptors on the smooth muscles of the large and small airways and when they're activated they stretch and they send signals to the pneumothoracic center to say hey that's enough pneumothoracic center would then contact the apneustic center to stop inspiration all right and then number 10 what's what's the structure at which respiration begins respiratory Respiratory bronchioles, or if you said the parenchyma would be fine. Okay, excellent. All right. Now, now we're going to look at questions that we're going to ask each other. Well, I'm going to ask you, and we're just going to kind of. Uh, uh uh. Yeah, you want to? Yeah, you need to. We're just practicing and reviewing. That's all we're doing. Anybody need to get out? You, you can, I can get out. This is the last thing we're going to do is work on this. Uh, pull these questions up as some sample questions from a, a old test for pulmonary AMP. And you can say, oh, I, well, you do number one, you do number three. Or we, you know, we just I read the question and you tell me what you think, OK? Here we go. All right. Sample exam. Number, everybody can see it. All right. huh. Number one, which of the following segments is not in the left lower lobe? Think about it before you say it. Miss Rose, I want you to do number one. Which of which of which of the following segments is not in the left lower lobe? B. That's the only one that makes sense. Apical and basal don't even make sense. The apices is at the top, right? And basal is at the bottom. So apical basal is not even a segment. Okay. All right. Number two. Which of the following airway components is the last to have connective tissue? This was a sample. Uh, remember I told you I wasn't gonna have to know all of the different tissue layers, but which one is the last one to have connective tissue? You say what? E? Okay, let's, let's see, because I ain't even sure. Number two? Number two is A. Number two is the sub subsegmental bronchi. But don't worry about that. You won't have that one. Number three, what is the best site for palpating the location of the trachea, uh, Ms. Cummings? What is the best site for palpating the location of the trachea? Palpate means to touch. So which, which one of those structures is the best place for you to palpate your own trachea? Number three. C. 
see. Super sternal notch. That's this notch right here, guys, between the clavicles. That little notch right here on top of your sternum. If you push back, that's your trachea. Okay? That's your trachea. Number four, uh, Miss Scott. The point of bifurcation of the main stem bronchi from the trachea is the B, carina. Carina. Miss Thomas, normal diaphragmatic excursion resulting in ventilation is what? We're talking about diaphragmatic excursion means contraction, flattening, just using another word. So normal ventilation, the diaphragm descends how much? Huh? Is it B or A? A, centimeters, 1.5 centimeters. 1.5 centimeters, but it can do six to 10 if labored breathing, right? Six to 10 during labor breathing. All right, number six, Ms. Fleming. Which of the following is true of surfactant? One of those multiple multiples. B, one and three. A little bit more. Good. One, two, and four. Does it doesn't cause alveolar collapse, right? It prevents alveolar collapse. So that would be one you could throw out. If you have a question like that, then any answer that has a three in it is not right. So B is out, C is out, E is out. So it's either D or A, right? So the answer is what? One, you said B, one, two, and four. Everybody get that? One, two, and four. It's, it's a phospholipid. It decreases surface tension and it is continuously produced and eliminated. All those are true. All right, number seven, uh, Mr. Simmons. Diaphragmatic excursion during labor breathing can reach up to what? Huh? Yeah, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why. Mr. Rivers. The diaphragm, the diaphragm, 10. There you go. It can go up to 10 centimeters. 6 to 10, but if you see 10, when it says up to, you're looking for the higher number, right? All right. Number eight, Miss Scott, which of the following is or are accessory muscles. Just the accessory muscles. C, scaling. Sternocleoid mastoids and the pectoralis muscle, right? The diaphragm is not an accessory. They only ask them for the accessory. Make sure you always read the question carefully. And the teres major, I don't even know where that is. I haven't even heard of that, right? So good job. Yep, so take that one out. If you ain't if you've never heard it and don't even sound right, take it out. Okay. All right, Miss Cummings. The diaphragm is innervated by which nerve? C, the phrenic nerve. Ms. Thomas, which of the following muscle groups are used for force exhalation? Which one is the best choice? Huh? Yes, one and four. But if you would have put one, let me see, is one, two, and four our answer a choice? No, okay. no, okay. Because I was, you know, diaphragm's still moving, right? It's still being used, but the, the, Major muscles for forced exhalation will be the abdominal muscles, right? And the internal intercostals, because they help with exhalation. Good job. But if you would have saw one that just was one only, I would choose one only, okay? 
So just be, it's real ticky. Just be careful what they're asking. Choose the best choice. Because one, you know, the one abdominals and diaphragm, you know, I would have just thought abdominal, right? But since they threw abdominals by itself is not a choice. Okay, well, what else can I say that, okay? Uh, uh, diaphragm is okay, uh, but intercostal muscles for sure, right? Because they help. But they help doing normal. He says force. So just choose the best answer. Everybody got it? All right. Miss Fleming, if a patient is in supine position when aspirating, which load would be most likely affected? If they're if they're in the supine position, what position is that? Flat on your back. So if you flat on your back and you suck in some water in your lungs, where is it going to go? What did you say? Right, lower, low. Right, lower, low. So it's going to go to the right, first of all, right? And, uh, and why they say right, lower, low, which segment of the right, lower, low is it probably going to be? It's in the back. What's the, it's in the back of the right, lower, low. Huh? No, 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 no. The segment of the right, lower, low that's in the back. It's also on the it's also on the back of the left lower low, superior, superior segment. Mm -hmm. So when laying on your back, it's gonna go into that superior segment of the right, not the left, because the left has more of an angle. So if you do, you're on your back trying to watch the game and you're drinking your little drink, <laughs> right? It's going in your superior segment of your right lower low. Chilling too hard. Chilling too hard. <laughs> yeah, probably done done. Number 12, Mr. Rivers. The pores, the purpose of the pores of cum are what? This one's kind of tricky, but you took the best choice, Mr. Rivers. Pick the best choice. And it's okay if you're wrong. Don't don't be timid. Just whatever you think. C. Give me some. Yeah. Collateral ventilation. We know collateral ventilation is communication between the alveoli, right? Through the uh, through the uh, pores of cum, right? Uh, but also, if you had, it's not collateral circulation, right? People might. It's not circulation, it's ventilation. It's air going in between, okay? Um, if they would have said, if they would have said, what's the purpose of the canals of Lambert and still had these same choices, I would still say collateral ventilation because you're ventilating, it's uh, communicating from the alveoli and the respiratory bronchial, right? They still are communicating. That's still called collateral. Oh, collateral ventilation. <laughs> All right, number 13, Ms. Rose, the purpose of the epiglottis. Protection of the trachea. Point blank period. My daughter says period all the time. What does that mean? Like, you on the phone, I'm like, period. Oh, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you had a sentence or something? <laughs> oh, boy, boy. Just like last class I had, we had cahoots. I play this computer game sometime where you can log in on your computer and everybody has the music and you can, it has a website called cahoots and I can put in questions and then it's a, a contest and you use your own name or you can use fake names, right? Uh, and somebody put WAP. <laughs> and so I'm calling a WAP the whole time. I said WAP in the lead, WAP in the lead. And everybody looking at me laughing. I'm like, what does what mean? And they said, Mr. Why, you don't know what that? No, I don't know what it is. And then I asked my daughter what it was, and she was, I said, boy, I tell you this. <laughs> oh, you're grown. You got me saying, whopping the lead, whopping the lead, whopping the lead. <laughs> oh, boy, boy. All right, number 14, Ms. Cummings. Which of the following are true of the type three alveolar cells? What's true of just the type three? I 
And this is one that you would have seen in the reading because it's a little tricky. But look at what you got and look at what choices you are available. You can take some of them out, like whatever you can take out, take it out. You know that type three don't do one of those for sure. So take it out of your choices. So with that process of elimination, I can take one, two, three of them out. With just that process of elimination, knowing what it doesn't do. So which one of them do you know it does not do? Number one. No, number two, allow for gas diffusion. Which one of the cells is for gas diffusion? Type mm -hmm. one. So we can take two out, right? So what that means that gets rid of A, that gets rid of B, that gets rid of C, uh, D, I mean. So all you left with is either C or E. Mm -hmm. E. Granul granular pneumocytes, and they also call pneumocystic macrophages. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know four is in it, right? Mm -hmm. You know four is in it. So it was either E, which is three and four, or what was the other one we took out? C, mm -hmm. one, three, and four. Okay, so. At the same time, allow for infection response. That that could be possible. So let me see what they say. Because it might be one, three, and four. Because mm -hmm. if something gets in there, I, I was first what number is that? Number 14? Let me see what they say on the 14. This is hard. 14 is C. Like, 14 and C, yeah. So, yeah, you, you was right. Allow for infection response. So, if they eat foreign material, something gets in there, it's invaded. This is, you know, I guess you can say infection response. So, good. Okay. Excellent. All right, number 15, uh, Ms. Thomas. Aspirated objects usually enter the right lung because what? Less of an angle, right? It's not about being less resistant, more compliant. And the diameter is bigger than the left, but you haven't read anywhere where it said twice as big. See how tricky that was? It didn't say, you never read how much bigger. It didn't say twice as big, it just said it's bigger, okay? So don't give them nothing that they haven't given you. And they're responsible for 70% of the title volume, never heard that either. The answer was A, because it's a less of an angle. Let's keep it simple. Uh, Miss Fleming, number 16, what is the purpose of the lungs? Main job of the lungs. A, external respiration. Ms. Scott, which of the following does not affect ciliary action? Now, this is very important. If you, if you, if you haven't read this, write it down now, guys. Because this definitely is a test question. The cilia, I don't know why that wasn't, I don't remember saying it, but the cilia are affected by a few things, okay? Uh, there's a few things that will affect the cilia for sure, four things. One is a decrease in the soul layer. So you're writing four things that affect cilia movement, okay? Number one, decreased soul layer. Number two, dehydration. Number three, cigarette smoking. And number four, thick, tenacious secretion. Swallowing has nothing to do with it. Okay, so the answer to that one, which one does not affect it, would be D, swallowing. But you need to know those other fours. A, a decrease in the soul layer, dehydration, cigarette smoking, which is the main one, and tena thick, tenacious secretion. Tenacious means like bubble gum. Mm -hmm. Sticky and thick, sticky secretions. That will affect the movement, right? It's stuck. It can't move. And so uh, it's very important because everybody, have you ever heard of a smoker's cough? Mm -hmm. When somebody who smokes all the time, when they wake up, they got to cough for about 10, 20 minutes to start the day, okay? They got that morning cough, okay? What it is because cigarette smoking 
paralyzes the cilia. So if you smoke the cigarettes all day long, your cilia is not moving all day long, right? And so all the stuff that you inhale is being trapped on the gel layer, right? And it's just, it's not moving, it's just there. But when you fall asleep, the cilia say, hey, he's sleep, let's move, right? Because you're not smoking. You're not sleep smoking when you sleep. So when you stop smoking, they come back to life. And while you're sleeping, they move, trying to get that stuff out, right? They look around, he's still asleep, let's move, move, move. So when you wake up, <laughs> it's right there, ready to go. And that's why they cough so much when they first wake up. It's because they cilia have been in action all night because they ain't been smoking. But when they wake up, cough all that stuff up, grab that morning blast, and there they go. Cilia back paralyzed again. Okay? So cilia are paralyzed by cigarette smoke, blunt smoke, all of that. Okay? And then when you go to sleep, they realize you're asleep and you're not smoking no more. They come back to life and they go right back to their job. Beating, pushing that mucus blanket up to the mouth. So by the time you wake up, it's right up in the trachea and it's nasty cough early in the morning. It's black, not necessarily black, black, but you know, it's dark colors, even because it's all that smoke all day long. And they smoke all day long. Is that, uh, Go ahead. No, I ain't no yeah. problem. Is that the same thing that happens uh, um, the paralyzed, like, it's paralyzed or something? Mm -hmm. you get caught in a house fire? Yeah, well, when you get caught in a house fire, what happens is, the hemoglobin, hemoglobin loves carbon monoxide, which is what the smoke is from a house fire, 200 times more than it loves oxygen. For some reason, hemoglobin loves carbon monoxide 200 times more. So in the presence of carbon monoxide, hemoglobin does not pick up oxygen. It won't carbon monoxide. And so that's how you die from smoke inhalation because you don't have any oxygen. Hemoglobin is fully saturated. You can look on the board and just say 100% sat, but it's saturated with carbon monoxide. See, the, the monitor does not know what you saturated with. It just knows that the hemoglobin is fully saturated. It has four binding sites. So oxygen, 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 and it floats around, right? But if carbon monoxide is on deck, then it's got part CO, 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 and oxygen cannot pick it up. So it prevents hemoglobin from using oxygen in the presence of carbon monoxide because it loves it 200 times more. It also loves CO2 20 times more than oxygen, okay? And that's what you, when we get into gas physics, you wanna learn more oxygen therapy and stuff like that, we'll talk about that in depth, okay? So that's what happens, but that doesn't affect the, the cell of the cilia, okay? Uh, that I know of. So decreased solar, remember we said that solar is mostly water right, under the gel layer. So if you're not getting enough water, you're gonna be dehydrated, right? Make your soul, 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 uh, soul layer less. And so you don't have much to move, okay? Because the cilia are up in the soul layer and they move that soul layer, which carries that thick, nasty gel layer across the top. Uh, so yeah, so those are the things. And thick tenacious secretions, of course, if your secretions are super duper sticky and thick, then the cilia can't move like they would normally move, okay? Make sure you study that part because that's gonna definitely be a, a test question all the way through respiratory. That's just one of those classic questions. All right, number 18. Let's look at this for everybody. On inhalation, which of the following are, I mean, are true? So the choices are the diaphragm descend, the anterior posterior diameter of the chest decreases, the diaphragm flattens and the diaphragm ascends. We want to know what's happening on inhalation, just inhalation, not both. On inhalation, which one of these are true? So use the process of elimination and try to see if you can get rid of one. I can see two that I can get rid of immediately. You said D? Okay, let's see. B is in boy. Okay, let's see. The diaphragm descends. Does it go down when you inhale? Yes. The, di the diaphragm descends. All right. It also flattens. That's the same thing. Okay. Uh, the AP diameter inside the chest, does it get bigger or does it get smaller? 
Hmm? When you, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, you give it bigger. When you yeah. take a breath in, the, the chest, the thorax widens, right? The ribs get bigger. So the anterior posterior diameter, what they're saying is this is here. This is anterior and this is posterior back here. This is the diameter inside the thorax. When you take a breath in, it gets bigger. It don't get smaller when you breathe in, right? When you breathe in, the, the diameter increases. AP, anterior posterior diameter. Same thing you're going to see when they talk about chest x-ray. You want an AP chest x-ray. That means they're going to shoot from the front to the back. Sometimes they may say they want a PA chest x-ray. That means they're going to shoot from the back to the front, right? Sometimes they want a lateral chest x-ray. That means you raise your arm up over your head and shoot from the side. So that's what AP. So we know that that second one's not true. It said on inspiration that the AP diameter decreases. So we know that ain't true, right? All right. Uh, diaphragm flattens. Yes. Does it go up when you inspire? If it flattens, it can't ascend, right? So it does not ascend. So the answer is one and three. Is that being yeah? Excellent. Good. Excellent. All right. Miss Rose, number 19, the left lung itself, the whole left lung, has how many segments? I think it's 10. Yeah, it's 10. It's 10? Okay. Two, three, and five. Two, three, and five? Okay. Let me just look at it for everybody else so y'all can see it. Number 19. Nineteen is A. Mm. Nineteen is A. Left lung. We're talking about the right. Because the right, remember, the left lung only has two lobes. Mm -hmm. So nineteen. The left lung has eight seconds. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't forget it's the patient's left and the patient's yeah. right. Yeah, that's easy to do when you first start out. <laughs> that's all right. Last one. What is the what is between Mr. Rivers? What's between the parado and the visceral floor? What's in between those two floors? We've got the parado floor that's inside here, inside the chest and that lines the thorax. And the visceral core is lining the lung. So in between them two, what is that? A small amount of pleural fluid. Excellent. Okay. Um, it says airspace. It shouldn't be any air in there. It should be just fluid. Okay. If there's air in there, that means there's a hole in your lung. That's a pneumothorax. Nothing. If there was nothing, they'd be on top of each other. That's a pleural effusion. They have effused together. Okay. And then should not be any blood, definitely not any blood. And it shouldn't be any surfactant, because if surfactant gets out of the lung, that means there's a hole. Okay. So it's a small amount of pleural fluid. That pleural fluid is also known as serous fluid. Serous fluid. All right. Do I have? I think that was it. Yeah. So that concludes the review. Uh, we did review today, went over the whole thing. We also, uh, I recorded this. We did practice oral questions today. Uh, class did very well. I'm very pleased at the progress, all right? Uh, if you didn't, what it, what it is, it also tests you, okay, what do I need help with, right? What do I need to go back and focus? If I missed all of the certain type of questions like the, the electrolyte dang every time i got electrolyte i missed it or when they, he asked somebody else i didn't know it either right let me go back and do that if i know i got the segments down pack then i'm not going to spend so much time on segments i'm going to spend time somewhere else okay so this is just helping you guide you into what you need to focus on and concentrate on more okay now um over the weekend uh, I'm going to put in for tonight one of those little easy uh, attendance questions again, okay? Uh, my test, our RT210C exam will be Monday, true or false, right? You want to ask that question. And that's why these, the grade inside Canvas is not your grade, okay? Because I have to do stuff like this and it might put points in there, right? 
that little attendance quiz might be worth points on here, but it's not really worth points. It's just for attendance. So your average is your two grades divided by two, okay? So for instance, if you got a uh, 75 on your first test and you got a 90 on your second test, that's 165 divided by two, your average is 82.5, okay? That's your grade, all right? And they co it comes up easy, guys. If you just stick with it, don't let it bother you, it's gonna come back up quick. And if your first test, we need to, when are you gonna do? Okay. Oh, you're going to take it today? Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. So that concludes that, guys. Don't forget you have the PowerPoints available. The, the other lectures that, are, that did go through and today's lecture will be available all weekend. Study, read. You should have no problem. The 20 question. I don't have any vocabulary words on this one. And then get ready for pulmonary mechanics. Okay. Good job today. I will see you Monday. So I know you can try to email the video. Mm -hmm. There's no other way you can't. I try, you know, I try so much.